Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm so excited that you're here today, and I want you to know that you're going to be hearing from three uh, professors at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. And if you would like to become a student of that school, check us out at Trinity Sem, Trinity S-E-M dot E-D-U, where you can learn from myself, Dr. <laughs> Jonathan Pritchett, and Dr. David Allen. The Dr. Dr. David the Allen. The Dr. David Allen. And one and only. Uh, Dr. Allen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's a delight and a privilege to be here today. Well, we are thrilled to be here with you, and we are looking forward to learning because we realize we are sitting in the presence of greatness. And uh, we, we, I see that everybody's really excited. Look here, yeah. Dr. Dr. Allen, uh, uh, I see here that Richard R. says, oh, my favorite preacher. Well, yeah. that's because Dr. <laughs> Allen teaches preaching. And on top of that, he's done a great deal of work on a particular item. He's done work on everything related to Calvinism, but he's done work specifically over the past several years on a particular doctrine of the five points of Calvinism, the, the tulip, the five points of the tulip, and that's limited atonement. He's written a very uh, lengthy work on that subject, Two. and then there's a second work, yeah. and uh, I encourage you to make use of those links that are below this video to take full advantage of everything that Dr. Allen says. Hey, if you want to, if you want to go to the kind of person that Dr. Flowers, Leighton Flowers might go to, to ask a question, well, we've got him right here. That's so right. Dr. Allen, we're so excited that you're here and teaching for us. And what, let's just begin this way. What, and we may answer questions as we go and we do kind of privileged super chats, but, uh, but right now let's just start with this. What do you, what, what is what was it that got you so interested specifically in the subject of limited atonement? Well, what how that happened really uh, it, it occurred it started back in about uh, 2006 when I was contacted by uh, Jerry Vines and he told me that uh, he was going to sponsor along with <clears throat> a couple of other seminaries. Uh, a sponsor called uh, a whosoever will conference a conference on whosoever will and in that conference he wanted to address the five points of calvinism and the problems with them uh, and so there would be papers delivered at the conference and a sermon or two preached and so he asked me would i be one of the speakers and i told him yes i would and uh, so he asked me to address the subject of limited atonement. And I was very happy to do that. I had never studied that in depth yet, uh, but that was the genesis of my interest in the topic of limited atonement. And so I began to study it in depth, or research it in 2006. The conference itself was held in 2008. And then the book, uh, Steve Lemke and I produced a book published in 2010 uh, called Whosoever Will. And the papers from that conference were essentially in that book. Uh, and my, that was where my first chapter addressing the issue of limited atonement appeared. And from then, from 2010 on, I wrote the book on the extent of the atonement, the big, thick, book 842 pages i think and that book appeared in 2016 then i wrote a book called the atonement a biblical theological and historical study of the cross of christ that book appeared in 2019 and there's a chapter in there on the extent of the atonement and then finally the book that most recently has been published is the book uh, calvinism a biblical and uh, theological critique and uh, so my chapter in their own limited atonement, uh, critiquing it as well, is the last work I've done extensively on that subject. So this particular subject has been sort of a hobby horse of mine since 2006. Wow. Well, I, I wanted to mention, I think I mentioned this last time that you, that you were here, but um, of course, you really rung the bell with the big, thick book. Uh, it, you know, it's mostly historiography running through uh, all of the um, historical positions of reform scholars, where they were on that position. But uh, I wanted to mention this again, because uh, a lot of people make use of that book on both sides of this debate, and probably more so than the other books that you've written on the topic. 
And it really is one of the most thoroughly researched books out there on the subject. It is, mm-hmm. it is the go-to book. And th- this is how I knew that Dr. Allen left no stone unturned because he dug up a dissertation by a guy named Hunter Bailey, who went to, who, who grew up down the street from me and went to the university of Edinburgh and wrote a dissertation that probably Dr. Allen, his project chair and three other people on planet earth had ever read. And that made its way into his dissertation. <laughs> so I have, I have, you know, that just went to the ends of the earth to find every nugget ever written on, on the subject. And yeah. And I wanted to say yeah. that, that whosoever will conference, uh, there was more than one of those, I think, because in Baltimore, when the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting was there in 2013, 14, 14, 14 maybe. Yeah. yeah, 14. I debated uh, Paul Cooper yeah. as the closing event of the conference that year. And, uh, and you know, it's kind of been great because people like you were my heroes when I was really getting into the soteriology stuff. And then now to be friends with you and, uh, and to be at some of those conferences. Um, I said on the thumbnail to this video that this is Calvinism's most triggering doctrine. Do you think that that is a fair assessment? Whether it should be or not, would you agree that for many, many people, this is the one that kind of is jarring for them when they hear it? I know that's true for some Christians I know. Uh, that's absolutely true. And it's, uh, it's particularly true within the Reformed tradition. Because one of the things that I demonstrate in the book, The Extent of the Atonement, is uh, the beginning of the Reformed tradition in the 16th century uh, with the first generation of all the Reformers. And uh, I'm including now the, the Reformers like Zwingli and, and Luther, as well as Calvin, number one. But number two, then those who are specifically, specifically in the Reformed tradition you know, Calvin and Bullinger and Zanke and all of those that were in the Reformed tradition. Here's what I discovered, that the entire first generation of the Reformed held to unlimited atonement. Nobody held to limited atonement among the first generation of the Reformed, and that includes John Calvin. Now, from a historiographical perspective, <clears throat> Calvin is technically a second generation reformer because he was still very young when Luther died. Uh, but uh, Calvin is generally uh, viewed as a first generation reformer. But Richard Muller, the doyen of a reformed historiography of 16th, uh, 16th and 17th century reformed history and theology, says that Calvin is actually a second generation uh, of, of among the reform. But my point is that, that Calvin included, along with all of that, that generation, that were in the reform tradition, never held to, to, re, to limited atonement. Uh, they all affirmed an unlimited atonement. In fact, in the entire church history from the second century uh, apost- uh, after the apostolic era and into the early church fathers, all the way to 1586 with Theodore Beza, you only have one person who affirms limited atonement, and that's Charles, uh, or that is uh, a man named Gottschalk, uh, who lived in the ninth century and who was an avid follower of Augustine and took Augustine's doctrines of uh, predestination to an extreme and kind of came up with limited atonement and he was condemned by three french councils and so dr it, dr uh, allen real quick i just wanted to say wow. uh we have someone here who said i already learned some stuff and only 15 minutes in and dan straight <laughs> says limit it is limited it's limited to humans but um yeah uh, I, I wanted to say mm-hmm. that do you think so and maybe you're going to answer this directly but um were these seen by disciples of Calvin as entailments of the system? Is that basically limited atonement comes about as a logical outplay of the other points of the tulip? Is that kind of how it came to be? Uh, that's how many scholars argue it came to be. I would be one of them. Not that I would put myself in the category of a scholar of Calvinism or anything, but, but I'd say um, you are. <laughs> uh, re- really what happened is that, uh, the Reformed got in in the latter part of the 16th century. The Reformed found themselves debating the Lutherans 
and also deba- debating the Socinians, and then uh, a little bit later in that time frame, debating the Armenians. And so they had three enemies from a reform perspective. They had three enemies. They were fighting on three fronts. And Beza and company, uh, I think, did, uh, basically took the concept of the unconditional election concept and derived logically from that limited atonement. So if Jesus, if, if, if only certain people are elect to be saved, then why would Jesus die for those that aren't elect to be saved, who aren't going to be saved anyway? And so there's a logical connection that they made in order to promote limited atonement. But you do not see limited atonement advocated uh, until 1586 and following, uh, and that's a historical fact. Uh, but that's, I think, the reason it's viewed as an entailment of unconditional election. It's certainly not. Now, the Reformed who hold it try to find biblical evidence for it. But yeah. the fact of the matter yeah. is limited atonement, as I've said many times, is a doctrine in search of a text. Yeah. There is no text of Scripture that asserts limited atonement. It is a, it is a logical cr- construct that doesn't have textual support. Yeah, that's that that slogan right there, a doctrine in, in search of a text. That's kind of something that a lot of people have picked up on, myself included. And we, we always attribute it to you. But it, it's such a great line because it when, when you when you look at various proof texts, right, that, that they try to offer or, or make inferences from you, it's 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 just a massive twisting and stretch of, of the text and what the texts are on about that that the case is actually better argued if they leave the Bible out of it than it is if they try to take you to any particular proof text. Mm -hmm. Because it makes sense within the construct of Calvinism, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, I know the four-pointers will will disagree with that, but it it makes sense when you lay out the tulip. But when you go to the Bible to try to support it, it comes up really thin, and and the proof texts don't really seem to— imply even imply it's kind of like a yeah the proof text and we may get into this might be things like uh that that it might include things like that jesus died for his sheep or something yeah or first john uh five one you know things well no that's more of a regeneration thing but uh it becomes a language game right so Mm -hmm. you get um sheep you get the world but then the world becomes the world of the elect you know uh, all becomes all kinds without distinction instead of all without except. So when, when you right. get into that and th- on that, that point right there, Dr. Allen, I'm curious your thoughts on the, I, I don't mind if you say all means all kinds without distinction, but that just pushes the question back. Is that all of all kinds without distinction or is that all without exception among the all without distinction? So that, that whole thing doesn't really a- address it. Just trying to say without distinction versus without exception because it could still be all without exception among all without distinction. So it re- that doesn't communicate anything. So I, I'm curious your thoughts on on the all question, because that seems to come up a lot in soteriological debates around a limited atonement. What does all mean? Yes. Calvinists love to jump on that and say there are many uses of all where all does not mean all without exception. In, ling- in language, that is true, uh, but it's not true of any atonement text in the New, in the New <laughs> Testament. And the context makes that crystal clear. The argument that uh, here's here's how it works. They take uh, a passage like uh, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. You know, take a look at that passage. In fact, it'd probably be helpful that, to pull that up and make sure we quote this one right uh, and make sure people see this one. But 1 Timothy, take 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 4 through 6. Uh Notice that, uh, well, verses 1, 2, and 3, Paul is urging prayers for all people, and uh, God desires that everybody live a, a, a lead a uh, tranquil and quiet life. Uh, verse 3, this is good, and it pleases God, our Savior. Now verse 4, God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved. Now, there is a clear statement in Scripture that God of what is called God's universal saving will. God desires for all people to be saved. And notice the, f- what follows that. For there is one God, verse 5, and one mediator between God and humanity, 
Now, look at that. God and humanity, one mediator. The man, Christ Jesus, now continues with the relative clause, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The antecedent of all there is humanity. God and humanity in the previous verse. Now, it is hermeneutically and exegetically impossible to weasel that all into some. You cannot do it. You can't do it in the Greek New Testament. It's not possible. It is a bad hermeneutic to say all there means some of all kinds of people. No, that's not the meaning. All there does mean all, and the context makes that crystal clear. So what what happens is you're practicing hermeneutical ledger domain. Now you see it, now you don't. Here, here it is. Whoops, where did it go? And so you're playing hermeneutical ledger domain with the text because you, you if you're a limitarian, by that I mean for those listening, people who hold to limited atonement, you are, they are limitarians. That is, by the way, the terminology that was used in the 18th century and the 19th century for people who held limited atonement. You'll see it in the writings. Uh, they are limitarians. Now, they don't like that terminology any more than they like limited atonement, but their, their doctrine actually is limiting the atonement to a certain group of people. But that's just a rabbit trail. So back to the all there. We love your, rab- you we love your rabbit trails. <laughs> what you have to do is convert that all to mean some of all kinds of people. And you cannot do that. There's not a way exegetically, there's not a way hermeneutically, and there's not a way logically to do that. That's not what Paul says. He already said Jesus is the one who has made an atonement a ransom for all. And it doesn't mean... Well, all of the elect or some of all kinds. Uh, it doesn't mean yeah. any of that. It means well, what it says. Well, the, the pushback I've, I've heard from Calvinism, uh, Calvinists on this text is, well, it's qualified because he says everyone and then qualifies it with kings and all who are in authority. And he says those are kinds of, of people. And I said, well, if you press that argument, that's not that's not condition. That's not uh, qualifying everyone to only kings, or otherwise you're saying the atonement is only for kings and people in authority. Well, yeah, the notion that you would have to, and I said this way back when you and I were preparing for one of my debates, I I was pointing out that, look, uh, in order to accomplish, in order for him to say what we're saying, like if we were right, the way he would have to say it with the constraints you're putting in place is he would have to name out every kind of person Every <laughs> profession, every race, every, right. you know. And, and the reason why Paul actually says everyone and then addresses kings and people in authority is to remind his audience that you may not want to pray for these kinds of people, but God right. wants everyone, including these people you're not inclined to pray for, to be saved. That's that's the point that Paul's making is, yeah, for kings and all who are in authority, you may not like them, but we need to pray for them too, because G- Jesus wants everyone, including, not qualifying, but including these types of people. Yeah, notice notice the all-inclusive terms. Notice the use of the word everyone in verse 1. It is not possible to make that word mean some of all kinds of people. So yeah. is Paul saying there are some people you don't pray for? That's the logical entailment of their argument. So first of all, you've got the word everyone in verse 1. And then notice you have the word in verse 4, everyone again. God wants everyone to be saved. Does that mean God wants some of all kinds of people to be saved? Of course not. He wants everyone to be saved. And not only that, then in verse 5 comes the universal term humanity. It is very clear that that word means all people. It means all humanity. And notice then the word all in verse 6. Here's your logical progression. Everyone, everyone, humanity, and all. It is impossible to convert those four words into some of all kinds of people. I'm sorry, it's just not possible to do that. So let me ask a question, Dr. Allen. One of the popular verses that that is used to indirectly support limited atonement would be John 17, 9, where Jesus says, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, 
for they are yours. Now, this this is Jesus' prayer here, and it sounds like he's saying, I, I'm not, I'm I'm just praying for a select group of people that that you know the people that the atonement was limited for. You know, that, yeah, that that kind of that kind of is the idea. What what do you say? to uh, something like that. And maybe while he's, do you have something ready on that? Yeah, I could, I can talk a little bit about that. There is a section on, on that in my book, the atonement a biblical theological and historical study of the cross of Christ. There's a section on that in my book, in the, my chapter in Calvinism, a biblical and theological critique. Uh, the, the bottom line is this number one, nowhere in John 17, are we ever told that Jesus only died for the sins of the elect. It's not there. Now, what you have in John uh, 17, verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world on this point, but for those you have given me. Now, but is that the last statement of any group that John is praying for or that Jesus is praying for? No. Notice uh, verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Now the group Jesus is praying for is extended from the disciples, which is who it is in verse 9, to Thanks. all believers, all who will believe in verse 20. Uh-oh, guess what? Notice what is said. Uh, that he is also praying in the rest of the verses there for the world. I pray for the world. And you see that, look at verse 23, uh, that the world may know, I'm, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And therefore he continues and notice, therefore, you've got three statements in John 17 about who Jesus is praying for. First, the disciples, then those who are believers, and then he's praying for the world. That's very clear. And there are many Calvinists, by the way, who are, are moderate Calvinists. That's a term that means Calvinists who reject limited atonement and affirm unlimited atonement, okay. whose exegesis of John 17 points that out. And of course, all of us who are non-Calvinists see that clearly in the Greek New Text and in, in Greek New Testament, and we point it out as well. But the, the full argumentation on that can be found in my chapter in the book, Calvinism, a Biblical and Theological Critique. Jesus prays for three groups of people, one, the disciples, two, all who will believe, and three, for the world. And you know, Dr. Allen, I think uh, there are a number of texts, and I'm sure you cover them all in your writings, that are used to support limited atonement, in which it says something like that Jesus uh, Jesus bought a certain group of people or died for a certain group of people. But those passages don't say he only died for those people. For example, Correct. Um, let's say at, uh, uh, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, right. it does not say he only gave his life for the church. Correct. Right. right. <laughs> or that you could do that with the sheep in John's gospel, you know, yeah. lays his life right. down for the sheep. Or Acts 20, 28, which says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. It does not say that he only purchased them. Yeah. No, that's correct. And That's the and Lutheran explain, argument, too. Mm -hmm. Lutherans let me point that out why. to Jesus. There are 17 arguments for limited atonement that I've been able to discover in my research. And I list all 17 of them in my chapter in Calvinism, a biblical and theological truth. Of 17 arguments, 16 are logical and theological. Only one is biblical. And the biblical argument that is attempted to make is actually a false argument as well. It, it centers around four texts. Matthew 1.21 John 10, 15, John 15, 13, centers around five texts. I said four or five. Uh, Acts 20, 28, and Ephesians 5, 25. Because in each of those texts, you have statements like, Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. Or in, verse, in Acts 20, 28, uh, Jesus Christ bought the church with his own blood. Ephesians 5, 5, 25, husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. Uh, John 10, 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, here's the, the thing about that. 
in none of those statements does Jesus say that he died only for those groups of people. That's the first thing. To infer that that's what these, these verses mean, which is what all high Calvinists do. Uh, the, the term high Calvinist means a Calvinist who holds to limited atonement. What they are doing here is committing the logical fallacy called the negative inference fallacy. The negative inference fallacy says this, if A, then B, okay, does not imply the negation. If not A, then not B. So uh, if, you, if you use this syllogism, this will illustrate it. I love my wife. Jeremy, my oldest son, is not my wife. <laughs> Therefore, I do not love Jeremy. Right. Do you see the logical fallacy there? That's, that's called the negative inference fallacy. It's the fallacy that everybody, uh, may, all high Calvinists commit this fallacy. So for this fallacy to work, I mean, for the logic to work, Jesus, uh, you would have to have a premise that says Jesus died only for the elect, or you would have to have a premise Jesus did not die for the non-elect. Neither of those premises are stated in Scripture anywhere. And therefore, it is a, a logical fallacy that is placed, imposed on these texts of Scripture to try to get limited atonement out of it. And it's especially egregious with Matthew 1, 21. Uh, Jesus, you will call His name Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. Now, mm -hmm. the phrase His people is Calvinist shorthand, right, for the elect. And it's Calvinist shorthand in systematic theologies for all of the elect of all time, the elect as a group, the abstract class of the elect, unborn, pre-saved, on earth but unsaved, those who are on earth and saved, and those who are in heaven. Nowhere does Scripture use the phrase, His people, that way. Yeah, in fact, that phrase, His people, occurs 11 times in the New Testament, and in every case, it refers to Israel. Yeah. It yeah, never refers to believers. And yeah, so that, Calvinists... That, or just uh, they they uh, just ignore this kind of thing in order to superimpose their grid on these texts. Right, that goes back to your 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 slogan that we all like so much: "In search of a text." You take the idea and you read it. It's eisegesis. You read it into right. the text instead, because exactly. it, clearly it's a statement about Israel. I mean, Matthew's entire gospel is aimed at 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 that Jesus's right. earthly ministry was primarily aimed at that so it's it's pretty clear in context it's just context uh i, I remember a, another slogan is that context kills calvinism because uh, oftentimes uh, calvinists have their th systematic theology before they actually get to the bible because they've learned that when they get into it they, they learn systematic theology before they learn next jesus right. and then the, they go finding support for their ideas backwards. And and I know that right. they're out there screaming and, and mad, say, no, we're the true exegete. I, I don't uh, No, I'm sorry, because if you if you start with a negative inference fallacy on all the five texts that Dr. <clears throat> Allen did, what that makes you do is now you have to you've already got those wrong. You already created a, a, a you know, an informal fallacy. And then you have to reinterpret every text that that supports an unlimited atonement and qualifies so many more texts because you started off on the wrong foot with a fallacious and before argument you go, in the first Before place. you go further, I just want to say that you guys will probably be blown away by this, but very famous soteriology pop star, <laughs> uh, Leighton Flowers, has shown up in the comments and has given us a generous super chat. Thank you, Leighton. And says, I just wow. want to say that I love you three brothers and appreciate your work well Amen. we love you too Layton, we well, love you too we're proud to be colleagues wow you. sorry to steal your Elvis, thunder this Elvis week. is in the building <laughs> that's right <laughs> we're here we are still in his channel's thunder yeah. right now yeah but y'all wow. carry on so but I did want to I, I did want to get to this um limited atonement has implications and the implications are in evangelism now I want to preface this by saying we're going to talk about presenting the gospel and is it a well-meant offer? Now, I want to preface this by saying 
the implication of limited atonement is, in our estimation, not a well-meant offer because of Calvinism. This is not to say, and I want to say this up front, that Calvinists aren't well-meaning or that Calvinists aren't sincere or that Calvinists are not evangelistic. That's not the claim. But when we talk about the well-meant offer, and we believe that Calvinism is lacking a well-meant offer, we're talking about Calvinism. We're not talking about any of you Calvinists out there who say, oh, I mean it when I preach. Great. Fantastic. But we're going to talk about, is it logically a well-meant offer of the gospel given limited atonement? So, Dr. Allen, would you set this up for us now that I've, I, I, I hopefully have silenced all the the wailing and gnashing of teeth that always comes about from this discussion? <laughs> okay. Well, yes, in order to talk about the well-meant gospel offer, you have have outlined what it is or what it what it means. the The problem for all limitarians with the well-meant gospel offer is the problem of of uh, if you hold to limited atonement and if God has designed, if the atonement is limited uh, by God himself, which if it is, it is, he's the one who did it. Then how can we who are preachers and how can God himself offer his salvation to those people whom he knows are not among the elect on the limited atonement platform. That is the issue of the well-meant gospel offer. Now, it's important to, I think, understand that the the well-meant gospel offer has to do with whether you can offer something to anyone that doesn't exist. Because you see, when you witness to someone or preach the gospel and call people to Christ, then those of your hearers who in a Calvinistic system are among the non-elect, you don't have anything to offer them. Your offer of of salvation to the non-elect cannot be real. It cannot be genuine. Because there is no offer, nothing to offer them, they cannot be saved. And here's why. There is no atonement for their sins. Think about it this way. Can anyone be saved without an atonement for their sins? And the answer is no. The atonement is the foundation of salvation. Apart from the atoning work of Christ, there's no salvation for anybody, period. So there must be an atonement for salvation to occur. And therefore, if you hold to limited atonement, then in any given audience out there, you've got elect and you've got non-elect. How can you offer the gospel to those who are non-elect? Now, Calvinists immediately counter, and here's what they say. They say, well, now, wait a minute, Dr. Allen, you don't understand Calvinism. I wish I had a dollar for every time I've been told that. (laughs) I'm amazed at, I'll tell you what I'm amazed about is how many Calvinists don't understand Calvinism. How many Calvinists especially don't understand their own tradition that, uh, the, that limited atonement is the new kid on the block. The first, the whole first generation of Calvinists affirmed a universal atonement, and and uh, the limited atonement uh, issue is the single most debated point in Calvinism in Reformed theology. Much less those of us who are non-Calvinists who realize that it's unbiblical. This was the single most debated point at Dort. It was the number one debated point at Westminster. And a third of the people at Westminster and a fourth of the delegates at Dort affirmed unlimited atonement. This is the, the, the well-kept secret that many within the Calvinist camp don't even know. They, or they act like they don't know it. You know, if you're a Calvinist, you've got to believe in limited atonement. Who told you that? Who made that rule? Okay, well, anyway, that's a bit of a rabbit trail. So the well-meant gospel offer says this that in order for the offer of the gospel of salvation to anyone to be genuine, 
there has to be an atonement for the sins of all people. If there are those for whose sins there is no atonement, i.e. the non-elect in a limited atonement platform, then you cannot legitimately, genuinely offer the gospel to them because it doesn't exist. What are you offering them? You're offering them the whole of a donut. (laughs) There is no salvation. There's nothing for you to offer. Now, here's what's interesting. The moderate Calvinists, that means four-point Calvinists, agree with this, as do all non-Calvinists. And guess who else agrees with this? Hyper-Calvinists. Hyper-Calvinists, like David Inglesma, recognize the the logic of the well-meant gospel offer that you can't offer the gospel to those who are non-elect. And so the, and the moderate Calvinists who reject hyper Calvinism, but who affirm unlimited atonement, moderate Calvinists also have written through the 400 years of reformed history, written on this subject and made this point that you cannot genuinely offer salvation to someone for whom it doesn't exist. Now, Therefore, not only is it a problem for you and me to offer the gospel, but 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20 says that God is himself begging through we preachers, unsaved people, come to Christ, believe in Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, wait a minute. God knows who the elect are and who the non-elect are on a Calvinistic system. How can God beg and plead people to be saved with the gospel whom he knows he himself has rejected by un by unconditional election he has already rejected them with unconditional election and number two he made no atonement for them through the death of christ it's the double whammy there is no way logically that you can have a well-meant gospel offer to people for whom there is no atonement now That is a logically airtight argument that cannot be answered. I think you're right. And in fact, Leighton follows up and says, Leighton follows up and says, if God doesn't love you and Jesus didn't die for you, then what are you rejecting? You're hating and rejecting a God who first hated and rejected you and a Savior who didn't come to save you. That's correct. But the the Calvinists will push back and say, "But, but Dr. Allen... After they tell you you don't understand Calvin, they're going to say, they're going to say, well, I don't know who the elect are, so I'm just going to present it. Now, I don't think that 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 response works because that misses the point. Just because we don't know who the the elect are doesn't mean that the gospel you're preaching is well meant. It just means that you're right. You're you're resting in ignorance because God knows God knows who the elect are. That's the point. It doesn't matter whether you do. God right. does. And it's not only you offering. God is offering that gospel through you. In fact, you're not really offering it. You and I are just the delivery boys. Yeah. God is you the know, one who it writes reminds me. It reminds mm-hmm. me, and this could upset a lot of people that are into newthetic counseling here, but Jay Adams in his book, Competence Counsel, from many years ago said on page 95, Three? 93 of my copy, I think it says... Um, you, you should never tell, and this may be, this may be not an exact quote, but it's the the pertinent information is there. You should never tell an unsaved counselee that Christ died for them. Only Christ knows the elect for whom he died. And I thought to myself, I mean, he's just expressing his Calvinism uh, consistently and directly, but I'm just thinking what a position for a counselor to be in where they can't tell someone Jesus died for them or that Jesus loves them. Right. It's yeah. yeah, now see, Calvinists differ on this. The hyper-Calvinists, some hyper-Calvinists will deny God's universal love. Mm. Now, Calvinists actually reject that. We need to be fair and, and adequately and, and rightly express the differences between hyper-Calvinism, high-Calvinism, and moderate Calvinism. Because well, why don't you break that there down are many, Yeah, hyper-Calvinists uh, are people who deny one or more of five things. Number one, they deny what is called duty faith. That means we believe the Bible teaches that it is the duty of all people to believe the gospel. 
a hyper Calvinist will will deny that. Some hyper Calvinists will deny that and say, no, it's only the duty of the elect to believe the gospel. And so any denial of duty faith uh, that it's the duty of all people to believe the gospel. That's a form of hyper-Calvinism. This, by the way, is the theology that Andrew Fuller, our great Baptist forefather, pushed back against uh, in those days uh, in the late 18th century. Uh, Andrew Fuller pushes back against this concept of duty faith in his work, The Gospel Worthy of All, Sal- of all Salvation. Uh, number two, hyper-Calvinists will deny common grace. A denial of common grace is a tendency of hyper-Calvinism. Number three, hyper-Calvinists will deny God's universal love. They will deny that God has a universal love for all people. Now, all Calvinists, whether you're a hyper-Calvinist or a a high Calvinist or a moderate Calvinist, all Calvinists affirm that God has a special saving love for the elect only. But then, but Orthodox Calvinism affirms that God, lo- God has a love of benevolence for all people. He has a universal love for all people, but it is not a saving love. Now, hyper Calvinist will deny that God even has that universal love for all people, that love of benevolence. They will argue that God only has a saving love for the elect. And then some hyper-Calvinists will go to an extreme and argue God doesn't love the non-elect. Doctor, That's Allen, a hyper-Calvinist tendency. Would, would, you, would you say that in that second category of a Calvinist who does affirm God's love but not God's salvific love for all people. Would you put someone like D.A. Carson in there, who I think oh, affirms yeah. a, a stance of love, but, uh, you know, that the God loves you by raining on your crops. He loves everyone that way. That's that universal love, right. common grace right. sort of thing. But, but he, uh, yeah, so I, I think that Carson yeah, sounds all like someone Calvinist. who... Calvinists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all Orthodox Calvinists. D.A. Carson, John Piper, you know, these are people who are not hyper Calvinists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so all Calvinists, if we can use the term Orthodox Calvinism, affirm God's universal love for all people. To deny that is to place yourself into the category of hyper Calvinism, which Orthodox Calvinists reject as error, and some would even say it is heresy. Okay, but Dr. Allen, there's actually a really great question here from Caleb Garza, who says, is hyper Calvinism the logical end to the Calvinistic system? So even if people like Carson uh, and Piper would never say those things or even believe those things, is this the logical entailment that it should be a hyper Calvinist? No, I would say no in the same way that uh, belief in universal atonement uh, does not logically lead to universalism. Talk the about error, that for a second. Someone asked the about The error that is on both sides, right? The error is on both sides. Uh, the Calvinist, the high Calvinist, wants to argue that if you believe in unlimited atonement, that Jesus died for the sins of everybody, then by entailment, you must believe in universalism that everybody's going to be saved. No, not at all. Universalism is the false doctrine that in the end, everybody's going to be saved. Everybody is going to heaven. And the error of the high Calvinist on that point is this. They are confusing the nature of the atonement as a commercial transaction, such that if there's an atonement made, it's ipso facto going to be applied. It's a confusion of categories. It confuses atonement accomplished with atonement applied. Atonement accomplished does not mean that it will be applied. Yeah, this was your, you made a response. This was kind of what you were saying in response to, I think it was Owen. Um, yeah, that, John that, Owen, right. Yeah, that whole tradition of arguing that way, this was kind of your response right. because they, they make a confusion between uh, those categories of, of, of accomplished and applied, right? Correct. Yeah, John Owen conflates, and all high Calvinists conflate uh, atonement accomplished with atonement applied. They argue that if the atonement is accomplished, it will ipso facto be effectually applied to all of the elect. Scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture no, never does, teaches that. 
neither does the Old Testament, you know, shadows and types doesn't teach that either. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, none of, right. None of the shadows and types of the Old Testament teach that. And the New Testament clearly teaches that the atonement is accomplished for the sins of all men. It is important, by the way, to insert that four word phrase for the sins of. If you don't do that, confusion reigns. And let me show you how. Uh, I'm not saying that all Calvinists capitalize on this confusion, but I am saying some do. I've seen them do it. Uh, when a pastor search team asks a Calvinist, do you believe Jesus died for the world? A Calvinist who is a high Calvinist can answer that question, yes. And the reason they'll answer that question, yes, even though the questioner means, do you believe Jesus died for the sins of the world? The, the Calvinist who affirms limited atonement does believe Jesus died for the world to bring common grace. And therefore, there's a sense in which he believes Christ died for the world. Now, most Calvinists know what that layman means when they're asking that question, but they capitalize on the ambiguity and they effect lie. Because what they are saying in answer to that question, yes, I believe Jesus died for the world. But now let me show you how to pin them down on that. Sure. Ask them, do you believe Jesus died for the sins of the world? No high Calvinist will answer that yes, because they believe in limited atonement. They do not well, believe well, Jesus died for the sins of the world. But, well, they could. That's they could, the key difference. They could say, well, the world... If you by that you mean the elect of the world of all kinds of people in the world, I mean they can convert that in their head maybe, but and they, they won't can, ever. And that's what, right. They won't ever and tell the person John who Owen asked did. that. You've got to dig Correct. that out of them. You got to dig that out of them. Uh, that's what John Owen does. They're, they're getting their arguments from John Owen's book, "The Death of Death and the Death of Christ." Yeah. And John Owen's book, was, the theology of that book, was refuted in his own day by Richard Baxter. And he was also Absolutely. refuted by Period. some others in his own day. And then I've gone to some trouble to refute John Owen, uh, John Owen's argument in my book, The Extent of the Atonement, as well, to show Calvinists and non-Calvinists who show that John Owen's understanding of limited atonement is uh, false. It's not grounded in Scripture. It's grounded in logical arguments where he makes logical fallacies. And so, but that, yeah, that's where that comes from. The key to ask a person as to whether they believe in limited atonement or not is to use the four words for the sins of. Do you believe Jesus died for the sins of all humanity? Immediately that disambiguates the issue because all limitarians do not believe Jesus died for the sins of all humanity. All of them. And by the way, listen carefully to Calvinists who preach on these texts, who believe in limited atonement. And notice how they will not say Christ died for you. What will they say? Christ died for sinners. Now, well, let me show you the dishonesty in that. There, I'm not saying they are deliberately being dishonest. But right. what I'm saying is they are blinded to their own dishonesty. Because if you or I are sitting out there in a service and we're just a normal average person who has a minimal knowledge of Christianity, but we know this, that everybody's a sinner. We know that much. And the preacher gets up and says, Christ died for sinners. What do you conclude? Everyone. Because all of sin and died for, everyone. For, he died yeah. for everyone because everybody's a sinner, and he therefore died for me because I'm a sinner. But if you're not among the elect, then that statement is false, and it's false because the preacher is leaving a false impression in your mind. This is my beef with high Calvinists. There, there is a level of dishonesty in what they are doing. That where when was the last time you heard a high Calvinist in a sermon on John three sixteen state Jesus didn't die for all of your sins? If you are here today and you are among the non elect, Jesus didn't die for you. No, all Calvinists preach like they are Arminians. Yes, 
when it comes to the subject of the extent of the atonement. I, they don't I was gonna, preach it that way. I was going to point out that uh, I follow Leighton Flowers uh, and I follow some of his, uh, I think it was Eric Kemp and Drew McLeod's uh, provisions perspective. And they're always posting these, these clips of Calvin, prominent Calvinist preachers who sound like non-Calvinist provisionist Arminians when they preach. But moreover, you, you did say that they will kind of try to say Jesus died for sinners, and in their mind that means some sinners, but everyone in the right. audience thinks also. Right. But they sometimes they get sloppy, because I was going to push, because sometimes I hear that more in a debate than I do, because that's their rhetorical point to me, that, well, we don't say Jesus loves you or Jesus died for you. We say Jesus died for sinners and God loves sinners. But then I hear... And when they preach like Arminians, sometimes they don't even do what you, you said. They don't say Jesus died for sin. Right. They're like, Jesus died for you. I mean, yeah. you know, well, it's they get caught reason, up in it. You it's, know? For, it's for this yeah. reason that uh, when I uh, when I talk about this, like yesterday or the day before I was on Leighton Flowers' show, and I just said real clear, yeah. look, I believe Jesus died for every single person within the sound of my voice and every person on the planet today. He died for Osama bin Laden and Adolf Hitler. He died for every person. The Amorite high priest can every... <laughs> be saved. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, make it real clear. But they, they, they have, but sometimes you, now you're, you're right. The, the, the sharper ones will say Jesus died for sinners, but I have heard prominent Calvinists slip up because it is so natural for people filled with the Holy Spirit to speak truth right. and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for everyone, you know, right. repent and believe. Now yeah. you make a, well, I, I have a section in my book on the extent of the atonement. I have a section on Charles Spurgeon. Now Charles Spurgeon was a five point Calvinist. He was a high Calvinist who affirmed unlimited atonement, but occasionally in his preaching, he slips up and he says, Jesus died for you to an audience that he doesn't know whether, you know, there you've got unsaved right. people and saved people there. And he slips up and he says that. Now, sometimes he'll say Jesus died for sinners. Sometimes he will say Jesus died, though, for you. Uh, and that's an inconsistency in Spurgeon, because if you hold to limited atonement, you can't say that. Now, notice the high, the high Calvinists today. Listen to their preaching. Go back and listen to Piper. Go listen to Al Mohler. Go listen to uh, uh, John MacArthur. They will not say, they're usually pretty consistent. They will not say Christ died for you, but you will hear them say, talk about Christ's death for sinners or Christ died for sinners. That's the, I don't want to say code language because I, I realize that sounds uh, like I'm, I'm putting off on them, but uh, it, that I'll, I'll say it this way. That phrase is a cipher for elect sinners. Yeah. Because if you believe in limited atonement, the only sinners Jesus died for are elect sinners. But one of the other pushbacks on the whole uh, the Wellman offer uh, issue is not only will they say uh, we don't know who the elect are, like we address that, but they'll also say, but but Dr. Allen, but but Dr. Braxton, uh, if they would repent and believe, then Jesus did die for them. <laughs> yeah. So I'm right. not. I'm not. I'm. I mean it because if they just would. Now I, I know that if they're unelect, they can't. But but if, if, without regeneration, but it's still true because if they only would, they would be saved. What's your response yeah. to that? Well, of course, that is so flimsy as to be nearly invisible. Uh, you know, uh, and so that yeah, that's that's a ridiculous missing the point and avoiding the obvious barrier in their way. That's, th that's what they're reduced to. They can't come up with any better argument or evidence to defend their case than something like that, which is so flimsy, it falls apart. You know, it just, you, you just blow on it and it's gone. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous argument that fails to see several things. Number one, the 18 clear statements in scripture that Jesus died for the sins of everybody. First of all, you got to get over that mountain. But number two, you got to get over the your logical fallacies of 
saying that something that doesn't exist for someone, you can tell them that you're offering something that doesn't exist as if it does exist. There's no way to logically defend that. There's certainly no way to biblically defend that. In Jesus's parable, he said, go out into the highways and byways and do what? Compel them to come in because there is food at my table. There is a full provision for the salvation of all people in the world. But not everyone will come. Not everyone will partake. Not everyone will come and sit at the table. You have to distinguish between atonement accomplished and atonement applied. Jesus himself, as well as the New Testament authors, have placed a condition on salvation. And that condition is faith. God has annexed a condition for salvation to occur. Atonement accomplished is not ipso facto automatically applied. It's only applied to those who believe. Well, and Dr. and therefore I, the atonement accomplished does not mean atonement applied. Yeah, and I, I don't, yeah, there's a well thought out question here from Manny Jones that says, this is a lover of self echo chamber. Nobody but self will worshipers allowed in. Well, you've been allowed in Manny and, and we've, we've listened to this uh, concern, but why don't you offer us the same charitability that we try to offer Calvinists and say, listen, we're going to, we're going to assume that they're, they're involved in this because they think they're trying to understand what the Bible says. And they think the Bible says this. Um, I know many Calvinists who I believe really believe that. And for people that take this sort of an approach, I would just say, have the same charity towards us that we just are really trying to understand what the Bible says and what. I mean, come on, man. I mean, I don't know about you, but every morning I wake up, I, I, I bow to my altar. It says free will. Right. And in, in, in gold lettering. Oh, I'm so glad to know right. I'm not the only one. Who right. Has a right. Free it says will free will and gold. And I bow down before it, it says your free will. And so I have the, I do this and I light the candles and stuff. Mm-hmm. You don't do that. I mean. No, I did. I'm just so glad to hear it was somebody else, not just me. Right. Okay. So uh, I don't. I don't know about you as a will worshiper, but but Braxton and I are are, are world renowned will worshippers because what we really care about is free will. Manny. Okay. Manny, I am offended by your comment. Your comment says that the three of us on this program and everybody else who believes like we do worship ourselves. That is an obnoxious lie. And I, I've dealt with yeah. Calvinists who do this all the time. Uh, they become so arrogant that they cannot even see beyond their the end of their own nose that there might be another way of interpreting Scripture by godly men who love Jesus and who live for Christ and who don't worship self and don't worship self-will. And Manny, you are an example of the kind of people who give Calvinism a bad name because there are some of you out there. Now, thankfully, I'm going to be charitable and say, I don't think all Calvinists are like you, Manny. There are some that are like you. But I don't think all are. I have many Calvinist friends. I I teach on faculties through the years with many friends who are Calvinists, some of whom are five-point Calvinists. We get along perfectly. We love and respect each other. We do not consider that one one of the other is a heretic or that somehow those of us who are not Calvinists of your ilk worship self. That is a gross distortion. It is an obnoxious lie. It is unworthy of a Christian. And my friend... You need to repent. Now, normally I don't that, get this strong with Calvinists, but we, I'm just going to tell you like it is. I get sick and tired of people saying that kind of stuff. And hey, I'm not going to Baptist. It. We, I'm going to push back and suggest well, yeah. that you need to repent of a sinful attitude and a sinful statement. We there brought, endeth the lesson. We brought, Amen. We, we brought in a, la- a loudmouth, leather long, red faced Baptist preacher. So if you all are shocked by this, what do you think we were going to do? Get in here and crochet in a circle. So, um, <laughs> but, but hey, listen, uh, before we go, Dr. Allen, and, and feel free, obviously, after I say this to, to summarize what you want to say, we have a few questions. Would that be okay? Um, oh, sure. I have a first Absolutely. One. And, and uh, we were going to, 
let me throw this in real quick as a as a as people are writing their questions as a little funny thing here. You know, right now this we won't have to spend too much time on this, but right now AI is is all anybody's talking about, and even some Christian YouTubers are using it for various things that make up your you know thumbnails at least or something. And it occurred to me today as I was showing my father what Chat GPT does that um, one could use this to write sermons with complete with illustrations, outlines, and everything. And so I I asked Chat GPT to write a sermon in the style of the man who was once called the Baptist Pope, Adrian Rogers, well-known Baptist pastor, Bellevue Baptist Church in outside of Memphis or in Memphis, Tennessee. And here is the sermon in the style of Adrian Rogers, an original sermon here. And it's got the introduction. And for those that know the alliteration here, God's love, unconditional and unearned. God's love, sacrificial and sufficient. God's love, transforming and empowering. Complete with a uh, commentary or, or the sermon itself. Now, right. it occurs to me that, and, and as far as I know, just glancing at that, I didn't see anything that I disagreed with. So here's the question. Are, are there going to be pastors who are not relying on the spirit, but on the algorithm to give them their sermons? And if so, is that okay, Dr. Allen? Uh, no. <laughs> in short, in short, the answer is no. But now let me nuance the answer and let me expand the answer regarding uh, using AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, AI is coming, and in fact, it's already here, and it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Uh, in fact, it's going to be developed uh, further and further, and who knows where it will lead. Uh, I hope it doesn't lead to some of the science fiction thriller movies that I've seen <laughs> where it takes over. I hope we don't have Terminator uh, you know, uh, roaming our streets, looking for pastors to get rid of them. So everybody that preaches has to use AI. Uh, you know, I, I hope we don't, I hope we're not going to get to that kind of world, but here is my take on it. And that's all it is. Just my, my opinion, my take on it. Using our, any form of artificial intelligence, you know, chat box, whatever, uh, for research. Absolutely. Use it for research. Uh, no questions asked. I haven't done it yet, but I'm planning on on uh, uh, testing it out and using it for some research things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think it's a perfectly legitimate research tool that would save a lot of time. Uh, and so, using uh, artificial intelligence for research, for sermon preparation, and so forth, absolutely. I see no problem with that. Now, I do see a problem with relying week on week in and week out on chat to write your sermon for you. I see that as a problem. Uh, in, in essence, if chat writes your sermon and you preach it, how do you avoid the plagiarism uh, mantle? Because you're essentially taking something that was done by some thing else, not someone else, but an AI. And you are, you're essentially, especially if you're going to preach it word for word, then you are essentially using material that you didn't develop. There's a word for that. It's called plagiarism. And so if you're going to do it, here's the only way I think you can do it. You get up on Sunday morning, you read your text, you say, ladies and gentlemen, before I deliver my sermon, I want all of you to know that my sermon was written by chat box, by artificial <laughs> intelligence, every word. Now, my suggestion is try that on your congregation and see how well that works for you. It will not yeah. work. I guarantee yeah. you it won't work. And but that ought to tell you something. Preachers, I, I've read about it just in the last two weeks. There are already preachers who are using AI to write their full sermons. Oh, wow. Now, if you do that for research purposes and you then go in and change it up a lot, well, okay, maybe if you somehow make it your own by not using it verbatim, then that, then that falls back into the, into the category of research. But if you're letting AI write your sermon and then you're getting up and preaching what AI has written, that's a problem. I'll tell you this, the Spirit of God is not in the neurons of AI. Amen. And the Spirit of God is not then writing that sermon. And that's a reason why you don't use AI to write your sermon. You are circumventing the work of the Holy Spirit in the sermon preparation process. And well, that so, I think no, Dr. Allen, no on that. 
that that sounds not only like good advice it sounds like the only sensible advice when it comes to this it's 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 a good way of thinking about yeah. it all right so we have some questions here by the way i want you to know i put up a, a poll now obviously we are a biased crowd here but uh i said is limited atonement is true true or false eight percent said true 92 percent said false I think that settles it after all these centuries of debate. I mean, uh, yeah. limited time. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Well, when you have when you have um, everyone and a large number of Calvinists mm-hmm. all saying that it's false, and then a another portion of only Calvinists saying it's true, it, it's they probably need to go red side flag. With, red with, flag. With, yeah, red flag. That that's kind of like it's kind of like one of those doctrines that you hear mm-hmm. that, that that you know. I, I'm not comparing this to like oneness pentecostal like anti trinity but if but if you come up with something that out from the global christendom mm-hmm. red flag yeah red flag. and by the way before I, let me respond to that but i see a uh, drew Beatty's statement mm-hmm. here about reading my book and i i thank you drew thank you for doing that and you're you're stating that your opinion is the strongest argument biblically for universal atonement first john 2 2 and first john 5 19. you are exactly right that text and the first timothy 2 4 through 6 text uh probably are the two strongest arguments biblically now there are several others but the two strongest texts that clearly affirm unlimited atonement his point there is first john 2 2 says we have an advocate with the father uh jesus christ the righteous who is the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world notice that terminology whole Ours world yeah. right and then first john five nineteen is the only other place in the new testament that uses that phrase whole world and in first john five nineteen, look at what it says that there are two groups of people, believers who are who are not deceived by the devil and everyone else in the whole world. So what is the meaning of whole world in 1 John 5, 19? It is the world of all unbelievers. You see, you've only got two buckets of people. It's really this simple. You're, you're either saved or you're lost. You're saved or you're unsaved. And 1 John 5, 19 says, they're the, those are the two buckets. And the whole world refers to all unsaved people. Jesus, or John, is saying in 1 John 2, 2, Jesus is the propitiation. He is the hilasmas, the hilasterion. He is the propitiation for the sins of believers, our sins, and for the sins of the whole world which by contextual exegesis has to mean all unbelievers. Therefore, on the basis of those two verses alone, if you had no other verses in the Bible, those verses clearly and conclusively affirm unlimited atonement. There's no way out of the dilemma otherwise. Well, and Drew, by the way, he has a, Dr. Allen does have a commentary on 1 John available, I believe. Um, yeah, it's a preaching commentary, but uh, what is it? It's like a semi-technical level, would you say? It's not uh, a technical. Yeah, se- uh, semi. Yeah, 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 semi-technical level would pro- would yeah would be right. So very accessible mm-hmm. to everyone who's interested in in in. And yeah. you in fact, it's resource. actually it's actually non-technical. Let me. It's it's not even yeah. semi-technical. It's non-technical because that series. I'm honored to write in that series. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for Kent Hughes inviting me years ago to be a part of that series. And by the way, as far as I know, I'm the only non-Calvinist in the, that entire Preaching the Word series, Old and New Testament. Wow. I'm the only guy wow. who's writing in that series who's not a Calvinist. I think every other author is. But wow. nonetheless, uh, Kent asked me to write uh, on First through Third John, and I was happy to do it. But that series is really sermons. Those are expository sermons, paragraph by paragraph, through First John. First John Fellowship in the Family is the title of that book. And yes, I dis- I discuss this issue in first in the sermon on First John two one through two. But it's really Excellent. very non technical. Anybody can can benefit from it. Excellent. Now, Derek says, and thank you for the super chat, Derek. Since he's here, what's David Allen's take on prevenient grace and the debate going on between Arminians <laughs> and Flowers regarding the nature oh, of grace? Oh my goodness. 
Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to decline to go into detail on that uh, right now because we don't have time. There's so much nuance that is involved there. Uh, I do believe in prevenient grace. I, 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 there is a form of enabling grace that all Orthodox believers have to believe in. You can't, you can't be a Christian and not believe that there is a form of enabling grace. Now, non-Calvinists define that prevenient grace or that enabling grace differently. By the way, you are aware that the term prevenient grace, I'm assuming you're aware, that terminology is also used by Augustine, used by John Calvin, and used by Calvinists. The concept of prevenient grace and the term itself is not limited to non-Calvinist or limited to uh, Arminians. So, uh, you know, that's the first thing that I, that I would say there. But the nuance, there's a very close relationship. or very, it's, it's, There's not much difference that I can tell between what uh, Arminians like Brian Abishano is a friend of mine and then provisionists like uh, 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 Leighton Flowers, who also is a friend of mine. Uh, there's, I don't think there is a lot of difference in what they are trying to say. Part of it is terminological. Part of it is semantic. Uh, nobody is a, a Pelagian here, and nobody is a semi-Pelagian. If some people want to accuse, either on the Armenian side, uh, want to accuse uh, those of us who might define that a little differently. Leighton defines it a little differently. Uh, but the way he defines it, as I understand it, does not fall into the category of Pelagianism. And I don't think it falls into the category of semi-Pelagianism. Now, that's just my view. But this that question is so loaded and is so nuanced, uh, So there's so much involved there, that it would not be possible in the time remaining for me to try to give you my all of my thoughts beyond these general statements that I've just made. Yeah, my 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 one regret when uh, Leighton and I were accused of being semi Pelagians by our debate opponents was because I had this in that big folder and I forgot to bring it up because I was just kind of raffled at the, or just annoyed at that point. But I was I wanted to say what is your academic definition of semi Pelagianism and, and where did you get it from? Because I had like seven different academic sources that define it. And I wanted to know what people mean by semi-Pelagianism because I have a bunch of different definitions and I want to know which academic source you're referencing and what that definition is because my view and Layton's view matched none of them. Yeah. So I, so when they just throw that out there, ask for a... So what do you think that means? What does that mean <laughs> and what is your academic yeah. source reference work? Right. Do we, that, let, that me, let me ask it? you a question. Do we have time? And if we don't, fine. Do we have time for me to read five paragraphs or maybe yes. six in my appendix, in the appendix to the book, Calvinism, a Biblical and Theological Critique? For you, Dr. Allen, you can read seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Here you go. The, the appendix is entitled Semi-Pelagianism, the Theological Catch-All. What is the heresy of Pelagianism? Simply put, it is the belief that individuals can make take the initial steps toward salvation by their own efforts apart from divine grace. Pelagians and semi-Pelagians affirm that natural human beings can initiate or respond to God completely independent of God's grace, is what they are said to hold. Uh, Pelagianism denies original sin, asserts wrongly that human nature is essentially unimpaired by the fall. Many labor under the mistaken notion that the term semi-Pelagian Pelagianism originated from the debates during and after Augustine and Pelagius in the 5th century AD. This is inaccurate. Theodore Beza invented the term semi-Pelagianism in 1566 and applied it to the Roman Catholic view of grace and human will. According to Beza, the central tenet of semi-Pelagianism is that it attributes salvation partly to God's grace and partly to what he describes as human effort. Faith is viewed both as a gift of God and a choice of the human will. In 1571, Nicholas Sanders, a Roman Catholic, began to use the term semi-Pelagianism with a shift in meaning, applying it for the first time to the 5th century debates and the Massilians 
the Mycenaean view would be more fittingly called semi-Augustinianism rather than semi-Pelagianism. The Massilians considered Pelagius a heretic and sided with Augustine on the priority of divine grace before human response, but they also differed with Augustine because they believed the human will acts freely in appropriating saving grace. The Massilians affirmed original sin, the necessity of divine grace for salvation, sought a balance between grace and human freedom, and doubted whether a just predestination could avoid being based on foreknowledge. The New Catholic Encyclopedia concurs that applying semi-Pelagianism to those who affirm God's initiative of grace and salvation is a misnomer. Semi-Pelagianism came to be used for a variety of post-Reformation positions that postulated a greater or lesser degree of human free will in the process of salvation. By the 1860s, the term had become common currency, while its original 16th century meanings and usages were virtually forgotten. Interestingly, Early Catholic catalogs of heresies of the Reformation period make no mention of semi-Pelagianism. There was no theological position identified by that term in the 5th and 6th centuries. This is not to say that the idea of semi-Pelagianism did not exist in that time. The Council of Orange condemned the position that was later identified with semi-Pelagianism. But note the elasticity of this term from the 16th century until today. Semi-Pelagianism means many things to many people. The historical theological context of the 5th century debates between Augustine and Pelagius and their surrogates have little or even no correlation to current controversies between Calvinists and non-Calvinists over the nature of human sinfulness. According to the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, the semi-Pelagianism of the 4th and 5th centuries, quote, maintained that the first steps toward the Christian life were ordinarily taken by the human will and that grace supervened only later, unquote. As recent scholars have noted, this definition needs to be refined considering the historical evidence. But, set, but setting that aside, go with the definition for a moment, since that is generally speaking the way the term is used today. And then I go on to point out that all the writers in this volume affirm that God's enabling grace precedes our response, and therefore none of us in this book can be rightly called a semi-Pelagian. And so Calvinists need to learn a little bit more on the subject of semi-Pelagianism before they go flinging that word around and throwing it around with everybody who happens to be a non-Calvinist. They've heard that's a thing to say, and, yeah. and so they all say it. Uh, it uh, Soteriology 101 was brought up a while yeah. ago about you know his views on all these things. and So good that Leighton actually commented here. I assume it's Leighton. If total inability isn't true, then the typical Augustinian approach to prevenient grace is unnecessary. But that doesn't mean we deny a need of God's gracious initiative, with uh, which is a form of prevenient grace. Yeah. So sounds like yeah, yeah. prevenient grace. That's the nuance. You can. Yeah. It's just a grace that comes before you. What that looks like is going to be different, even among Arminians mm-hmm. as well as right. provisionists and and everyone else. Now, is it fair to say, Doctor Allen, before we get to the next question, that coming off your your final statement there about they need to go do some research and, and learn what the word. If somebody is using the label semi-Pelagian in a discussion with a non-Calvinist, is it fair to say that the Calvinist, the, the non-Calvinist should go ahead and assume that they are not talking to a serious person? Is that fair? Uh, it, it, it could be. In some cases, that is indeed fair. Yeah. You see, here's the problem. Here's, here's the issue. I meant to say this. Some Calvinists, not all, but some Calvinists just simply view all non-Calvinists as ipso facto semi-Pelagians because they believe in libertarian free will. In other words, from a Calvinist perspective, some Calvinists, semi-Pelagianism equals belief in libertarian freedom. Mm. Now that's just false. That's just wrong. Because we believe in libertarian freedom does not mean that we are semi-Pelagian. Right. Yeah, that's a non sequitur. Yeah, let's let's get on with this. It's like saying I, be, you know, I believe in 
biscuits and gravy for breakfast. Therefore, I mean, that, it doesn't follow. Right. You know? Right. All right. Uh, Yunus Ahmed says in regard and thank you for the super chat says in regards to God's will to not save everyone under Calvinism. Has anyone ever given you a good reason for why God doesn't, Dr. Allen? If not, can you think of one? <laughs> uh, no, from the from a Calvinistic, I'll answer from a Reformed perspective. Uh, that is all in the imponderables of God, in the hidden will of God. God has not chosen to disclose why He has decreed some uh, to be gifted uh, the the gift of grace and thus salvation, uh, and the gift of and regeneration and thus salvation, and others have not. The Bible doesn't say. Reformed theology doesn't say they retreat behind the curtain of God's imponderables of the of the decretal will of God, the hidden will of God, and so no, they cannot give you a good reason, and nor can I. I can't give you a good reason either except to say what the Bible says. And here's what the Bible says. God loves all people. God desires the salvation of all people. Christ died for the sins of all people. God is willing that all should repent, that that none should perish, but all should repent and come to Christ. But not everyone comes to Christ. And the reason why they don't come to Christ is not unconditional election. The reason is their own free will. They choose to reject Christ. Therefore, they are culpable of their for their choice. Therefore, God is just in damning them in hell for their choice. And all of that is the biblical revelation, as I understand it, of God's plan of salvation. Well, let's see right now if we can go, if it's okay with you, can we go till 2.30, let's say? It's about five more minutes. And maybe oh, we can... Oh, fine with me. Yeah, we can hit some of these uh, that are not super chats, but that we do appreciate here. First of all, this could be an interesting one, and it could take us far afield, but... Um, this is a Fuller graduate who's a friend of ours, New Testament theologist, Nick Quint, says, given once saved, always saved, um, how, or eternal security, how does Dr. Allen navigate the issue of selective soteriological determinism as it relates to the above theological position? Also, subscribe to my channel, hashtag shameless. Um, let me, let me explain. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I think his question is, if, 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 once saved, always saved is true, or eternal security is true. How is that not a form of determinism that 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 God would ensure that you'd never use your libertarian free will uh, to walk away? To walk away, yeah. uh, because of the nature of regeneration. Regeneration is an unrepeatable, un it is an inviolable event, in my opinion. This is why I think eternal security is true. I think it's true first because I think the Bible teaches it. Actually, I'll go even a step further. Now, this is for another time. But I think the Calvinist gets unconditional election wrong because they think it is election to salvation. Actually, what is predestined and what is unconditional is final salvation for those who are in Christ. That is what Scripture says is going to happen. That's the predestination. Look at Romans 8, 29. Look at First Peter uh, 1, 2. Look and at any of one. the texts that talk about it, uh, and, you will, and you will discover that what people are predestined to is final salvation. They're not predestined to salvation. I think both Arminians and Calvinists are wrong on that question. Uh, that what, is, what people are uh, predestined to is glorification, is final salvation, and that is unconditional. I believe, and I realize there are people that, that differ with this, maybe even yeah. right here on the screen might differ a little bit, but I believe that what Romans 8, 29 and following teaches is that those who are in Christ, regardless of the debate of how they got to be saved, those who are saved are going to be maintained in that position of genuine salvation via regeneration and will be unconditionally brought to final salvation. So do I believe in a form of unconditional election and unconditional predestination? You bet. 
I just don't believe in the Calvinistic form of unconditional election because Calvinism teaches that we are elect to salvation. The scripture doesn't teach that. The scripture in Ephesians 1, 4, Romans 8, 29, and 1 Peter 1, 2 uh, teach that what, if look at the words in the Greek New Testament, what you are predestined to or elect for or whatever, however you want to term it, is not initial salvation. It is eternal, final salvation, glorification, because theologically salvation occurs in three tenses. You have been saved, that's justification. You are being saved, that's sanctification. You one day will be saved, that's glorification. That's what Romans 8, 29 is talking about. Notice Romans 8 addresses believers. It's not talking about people who aren't believers and how they become believers. It's addressed to, to believers and their final destiny. So there's my little sermonette on awesome. that. That's how yeah. it that, I really appreciate yeah, that. We're not going to get into a debate on that <laughs> here. But, I'm, I'm fine yeah. for the two of you to debate, but we'll do that. Well, I don't, no. <laughs> they asked for his opinion. They've heard my opinion on this every week. Do you so. think that limited atonement is the weakest point of the doctrines of grace? Oh, no question. It's absolutely the weakest point because it is the point that has zero biblical support. Okay. Uh, I don't like the, I, I don't, doctrines of grace, uh, you know. I don't like that of, phrase either. Yeah, that, that's kind of trying to monopolize a... Sure. A, a what, you don't believe in the doctrines of grace? I, I do, but if you want to understand... <laughs> no, I'm saying that's how it feels. Yeah, I know, but, uh, yeah. but I'm like, yeah, but if you want to understand grace in Paul's day, look to contemporaries of Paul, right. uh, read Seneca's On Benefits. He tell, he explains the ethos right. of and grace say, and the uh, socioeconomics of uh, patriarchal uh, reciprocity. See, but this we'll, guy's yeah. trying to... Poo poo grace. Right. He hates so unless grace. you're talking about <laughs> socioeconomics of first, you know, the ancient Mediterranean world, you're not really talking about anything the Bible's talking about. See, it's got unbelievable. Yeah, grace. yeah, That's what they say. yeah. I don't like that <laughs> term either. The idea, the idea that only Calvinists affirm doctrines of grace. Of course, we non-Calvinists affirm doctrines of grace. Yeah, Derek says here again. What do you say to Calvinist counterpoint to what you said about limited atonement? That God doesn't say marriage or the all statements. I guess. Marriage is only between one man. Oh, this is because of the limited atonement passages that say like he died for his sheep, I guess, but not. But that doesn't mean he didn't die for everybody else. What do you say to the Calvinist counterpoint that God doesn't say marriage is only between one man and one woman? But God does say marriage is only between one man and one woman. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand the question. The, yeah, the scripture God is allowed. clear. Yeah, well, well, God it, allowed. Yeah, God allowed. Yeah, God allowed people to practice polygamy, but he never affirmed right. the practice of polygamy. Exactly. And clearly, Genesis 1 and 2 affirm uh, marriage as between one man and one woman. So there's no statement where God says marriage is not between anybody other than a man or a woman. The Bible does say that marriage is only between one man and one woman. So I would say this must be apples and oranges. You're talking, talking about marriage, and you want to then compare that to the eternal souls of, of people by virtue of the atonement or no atonement. That's kind of apples and oranges, I guess, in my opinion. D Derek is Derek is a person who actively engages with Calvinists yeah. on a regular basis. So he's probably yeah. trying to, to the issue out of the atonement to... is a distinct one from the issue of who are God's eschatological elect. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. when the Bible refers to the elect people as, you know, the body of Christ as the elect, as the bride of Christ, mm -hmm. that's that's not a statement about atonement. That's a statement about the identity of God's people. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct. Those being that's in Christ. So Correct. it is an apples and oranges thing. So I don't, I don't know where they would think. Tell that them that, Derek. When they say it again, say David Allen says that's apples and oranges. Okay. <laughs> he also says. Well, let me say. How does, by the way, let me let me say this real quick before we answer that. Uh, the uh, the cons, the word elect. Look it up every time it occurs in the New Testament, and here's what you will discover. Number one, it never refers to the abstract group of all of the elect of all time in a Calvinistic theological doctrinal system. Number one, never refers to that. Number two, it always refers to believers. 
The term elect in the scripture never refers to somebody who is an elect, but a non-believer or non-existent. So I would basically say to my Calvinist brothers, put that in your theological pipe and smoke it because you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time making the elect mean what you want it to mean biblically biblically it doesn't mean what you make it mean in your systematic theologies dr allen i think you probably would be most uh qualified to know which book we were talking about when he answered when he asked this question but he's wanting to know how does it compare to from heaven he came and sought her which book do you think maybe he can tell us i don't know um that's a, yeah, what that's a col- collection of essays on yeah, I think he right. may be referring to the newest book. Yeah. Yeah, I, if the antecedent of the word it is referencing my book, our book that I've co-edited with Lemke on Calvinism, a biblical and theological critique, then um, it it basically, the, my chapter, my chapter defeats the arguments of all of the limitarians in the book, From Heaven He Came and Sought Her. But the, real, the book that does that Actually, the best is my book entitled The Extent of the Atonement, because I have 100 pages in that book. A whole section of that book takes every chapter in From Heaven He Came and Sought Her. Every author, it's an individual author, multi-author book, and I critique every chapter. And I show you where the errors are biblically, theologically, logically, and historically Historically, in that book. Yeah, I I, I remember that you did. Um, I remember reading that in the book, but there was also, I think, prior to the book's release, I, uh, your website yeah, does I have. Did, I did a series of blog posts answering that. Yeah. Yeah, on your website. Yeah. And I found that I was almost embarrassed for some of those authors, especially on the historical point that they should. I mean, that was kind of embarrassing. Well, you yeah. know, for, here, for them, I, I felt, I felt, I felt like David Allen was being uncharacteristically not mean like straightforward but blunt enough to say guys i mean you your scholarships a he little said, bit I, he said this is well stupid. i did I on two of them i think i think two of those men i did say look your scholarship here is is way flawed and in yeah. fact now i'm not going to name a name but that i don't and i don't know if it was because of my work there but somebody who had written on the patristic the early church fathers and how they uh, the, the evidence they held a limited atonement. There is a scholar who wrote on that in a book, which I quote, and that scholar has since totally revised that chapter and taken out all of the claims of people that he claimed held a limited atonement that mm. I and others have demonstrated. He was uh, very historically loose uh, in his methodology of research. Telling. This is a Telling. this is an important point that I, I want to make that, that you sometimes run into with uh, evangelical Calvinist scholars. Um, you get the impression, because they're so steeped, and part of this is curriculums that reformed leaning seminaries and everything else, they, and I, I'm not saying all of them, of course there's exceptions, but but a large number of Reformed scholars, even the, the evangelical Calvinistic scholars, they are not very good on Second Temple Judaism. They selectively read it. I think justification and variegated gnomism prove that, except for Peter Enns, who's no longer welcome in their circles. Um, they're not very good at the Greco-Roman literature. They, they either don't bother at all or they selectively read it. And then when it comes to the Church Fathers, they either selectively read the Church Fathers or reinterpret or reinterpret or, or don't right. even bother. They're they're so wrapped up in reading their own tradition that they right. they don't really become expert. I mean, a few do, but most of the evangelical scholars and popular pastors are just they're no more qualified to talk about those issues of Second Temple Judaism, Greco Roman literature, or um the patristics. Right. Than anybody watching this program, they just are not that well versed in it. No, I well, dem- I demonstrate in my book the extent of the atonement where some of those high Calvinists cherry pick quotations from the uh, early church fathers, and I show those quotations in context. Yeah, and therefore course. demonstrate that that's not what they are saying. 
And so I call their hand on that. Uh, Doctor, now, what those guys are quick. doing, let me tell you what they're doing real quick before you comment. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. The, almost, almost all of those guys are depending on John Gill's work on that. John Gill has some extensive work where he's trying to show a number of the early church fathers held to limited atonement. Well, Gill was a hyper-Calvinist. Now, I know that there are some people that try to uh, sanitize Gill from his hyper-Calvinism. Uh, I recognize there are a couple of people that like to try to do that. But Gill was a hyper-Calvinist. And, and Gill's historiography on the issue of limited atonement and the church fathers is totally flawed. Uh, it lacks context. He pulls quotes together, one from one page, one from three pages be, to, uh, away, and then knits them together as if it's one quote. I demonstrate the fallacies in Gill. And what I found is the guys in From Heaven He Came and Sought Her, some of those historian, history, history guys that are dealing with it historically are just quoting Gill. They don't even look at whether Gill was right or wrong. They are just simply parroting Gill, and their historiography uh, is just as flawed as John Gill's. Right. Uh, that bringing up John Gill reminds me. It, it kind of ties into what I was my my comment. I was going to say. I, I do want to condition my comment about the sloppiness of uh, Calvinistic scholars uh, in those three areas. They're typically, when I say evangelical Calvinists, I'm, I'm typically talking about the Baptist tradition of which John Gill is a part of. The Presbyterians right. are a little bit better educated on things like the patristics and Second Temple Judaism and things like that. So uh, I, I don't want to be too hard on all Calvinists. I just want to be hard on the Reformed Baptist crowd because they're 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 not very confident or well versed like the Presbyterians. But on the flip side of that, the Presbyterians who are well-versed in Greco-Roman literature, they're well-versed in Second Temple Judaism, well-versed in uh, the patristics, they don't make all the claims that the Reformed Baptist crowds do about those yeah. issues. So they're, they're, those scholars are better to read than the Baptist scholars. So anyway, I didn't want to throw in, all in, Calvinists under the bus. But In fact, this is historically true. This is historically true as well. Those who are in the Reformed tradition who are you know Presbyterians or Anglicans or others, uh, I've, I've seen this in some of the writings in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. I'm sorry, 18th, 19th, and 19th centuries. They laugh at Reformed Baptists as being ignorant. Uh, I, Richard, I, Muller, I, yeah. Richard Muller has an argument, has a, a, an article where he makes a, the, an argument that it's impossible for any Baptist to be Reformed. You can't be a reform. You can't call yourself a reform Baptist if you're a Baptist, because by definition, reform theology entails a pedo baptistic ecclesiology, and it entails a top down ecclesiology of church governance, both of which Baptists reject. Now, and, you can be a, real a communist. View of, yeah, and a real presence yeah. view. And uh, I know Reformed yeah. Baptists split on real presence. Some some will affirm it, but both still are the the um, the symbolic view of the of the um, Lord's yeah. Supper. So, but I, I agree with that. I I, I don't think ba Reformed Baptist is just a contradiction in terms. Two it's, two questions it's a bad, left. It's but go bad ahead, terminology. Doctor. It's bad terminology. Reform. What they mean is Calvinistic Baptist. They're Baptist Thanks. who uh, accept. Calvinistic soteriology. They accept Reformed soteriology, but they do not accept Reformed, ecclesi Reformed ecclesiology. They're right. tulipists. They're, they're tulipist plagiarizers. You know, this London Baptist 1689. Yeah, pretty okay. much. they're tulipers. Okay. Also an acrostic, which never occurred until along about 1917 or 16 or somewhere in there. The tulip acrostic never occurred at Dort. That's yeah. what's that many people will be shocked to learn that. Yeah. Dort was actually the, the order they took it was old tip. It was unconditional election, limited atonement, total uh is out of order, you mean? Yeah. Old tip. Old tip, yeah. <laughs> um all right. So we have here from Bryce Gladwin a statement that we've actually seen bear out in this stream. And yeah. that is uh, not trying to attack Calvinists, but why do they seem to be suspicious of other denominations? You present your argument, and they almost seem to imply you are hiding your real intent. Again, not all Calvinists, right? 
<clears throat> what do you guys think about this? Why do they seem suspicious of other denominations? I think it means other soteriological Yeah, yeah, that's what it means. Um, yeah. You present your, and they almost, Calvinists, um, not all, but Calvinists, people who have been engaged in this debate, I, I guess since, uh, well, since the Reformation, they're very cultish in their, they're adamant that we have the truth. Like mm -hmm. we have the universal doctrines of grace, the, the theology. That's a universal theology of all times and all places. This has always been true. This is biblical truth, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of thinking that it's what it is, which is a interesting and curious, highly contextualized post medieval theology in the West uh, That's all it is. But, but they think, it, and so when they, they get so dug in that it's, it becomes a them against the world. And so I think Calvinists have this idea that if you're not with them, then you are, a, you know, maybe you have some sort of an ulterior motive. You're, you're trying them. to, you're trying to demean, like, like Leighton and I were told, today, we're, we're, we're demeaning God. We're, mm -hmm. we're demeaning uh, the work of Jesus who, who, who didn't waste a single drop of blood. And how dare you think a single millimeter of his blood was wasted on a non-elect that it couldn't say, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I think it's like you said, it's just too much Red Bull, right? You know, uh, but Peter W., who I think is a Calvinist, seems to be, says, I hear people suspicious of Calvinist motivations all of the time. Well, I think that's certainly true as well. Now, uh, honestly, uh, uh, when, I, when people are suspicious of Calvinists, it's because some of these entailments of Calvinism are so shocking to someone who first hears them and seemingly so at odds with what they've understood about uh, the nature of God and the character of God or whatever throughout their lives. And so I, I would imagine it would be. But of course, there's people on all sides. Now, let me tell you why it's fair to be suspicious, and maybe not of Calvinists, but of Calvinist pastors. Because uh, if you're in the Southern Baptist Convention, there's a group called the Founders, and they had a whole thing dedicated to how to implement Calvinism in churches that were not Reformed Baptist churches. And it was kind of, I mean, that's not what they call it, but we call it stealth Calvinism. And there was story after story after story of churches being divided where pastors would come in not claiming their Calvinism or even denying that they're Calvinism because they don't like labels or whatever. And within a year, the church is split or shrank or, or all kinds of things that have happened. That Calvinism has done that because people were not up front. Uh, and you can search the Internet and you will find... A, you know, hundreds of churches that have dealt with this issue. So okay. if people oh, are yeah. suspicious, it's because I think it's a local church issue has made them suspicious, at least within certain Baptist and probably non-denominational churches where Calvinism caused a real problem in the congregation. Right. Now I'm going to go a step further than that and make some people really irritated, possibly the gentleman who asked the question. Oh, don't the worry. Reason he said he why, the reason why some of us are suspicious is because some Calvinists lie. Now, you may not like that, but I'm speaking from personal experience. Uh, I, deal, I deal with the, the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention, and I have had many pastor search committees tell me their story. Number two, I was dean of the School of Theology and then dean of the School of Preaching at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary for 18 years. During that time, as a dean of the School of Theology, I sat in on the interview of virtually every person that was hired uh, into the School of Theology. I dealt with people in those interviews who, when asked the question, uh, do you affirm limited atonement, that Jesus died only for the sins of the elect? They would tell me, absolutely not. They get hired, and three months later, they're teaching, uh, they're affirming limited atonement in the classroom. Now, to my Calvinist story. friend who just asked that question, let me tell you what that is. That is called prevarication. That is called lying. Now, I dealt with that more than once as a dean. I've dealt with it dozens of times as, as someone who is a counselor to pastor search committees across the Southern Baptist Convention. So if you want to ask, why is there suspicion of some non-Calvinist toward Calvinist and then put your LOL on the end, then I'll give you a hundred reasons why, because I've dealt with Calvinists who lie. Now, am I saying all Calvinists are liars? Of course not. Am I saying most Calvinists are liars? 
Of course not. Am I saying some Calvinists are liars? You bet I'm saying it because I've lived it. Yeah, and there's enough of them to make people suspicious. Uh, you know, a little leaven uh, spoils the whole batch. I mean, you guys are, Paul says you guys that, are so. so soft. You never get bold and just say what you think. <laughs> yeah, why don't you um, tell us what you really think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question, last question, and I'm sorry for everyone else who may have asked questions. Uh, Jamie says, how does the atonement inform theology of the covenants and Jesus' fulfillment as the Messiah of the Hebrew Scriptures? Common mistakes people make regarding claims about the atonement. So, you know, the atonement comes at the end of the Jewish uh, sacrificial system and Jesus dies uh, to atone for the sin of the world. How does that connect with that system, I think? Is the, the author of a great, highly recommended, wonderful Hebrews commentary, Dr. David Allen, is the right man to answer that question. <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, Calvinists have too many covenants. They've got covenants that aren't biblical. They've got the covenant of redemption, which is, as Karl Barth said, is Christian mythology. Where in the Bible do you have this revelation of God the Father and God the Son get together and have a conference and determine that God the Father is going to elect some and then the Son says, I'll go die for those, et cetera, et cetera. Number one, where's the Holy Spirit in that process? Number two, how do you have covenants between members of the Godhead? What does that do about the nature of simplicity in terms of theology proper and a host of other problems, not the least of which is that can't be found in Scripture? Um, and, and so, I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I just, you know, I've dealt with this for so many years that uh, there are people who just place, you know, the Westminster Confession and the uh, Canons of Dort, and, and they're just right up there almost on the level of Scripture. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to trust a gaggle of baby baptizers to be able, who, by the way, had no Baptists involved uh, in any of their meetings. Of course, we were early uh, we just started a few years before West, before uh, Dort, and only you know about uh, uh, thirty-five years before Westminster, or maybe thirty years before Westminster. But am I going to uh, am I going to trust a gaggle of baby baptizers who can't, in my view, get soteria? Who, who definitely got ecclesiology wrong? Am I going to trust them to tell me about soteriology and the covenants when they don't involve anybody of my tradition? Uh, no, I don't think they got it all right. I'm sorry. But in, now to try to get to the specific answer to the question here, uh, you do have the, cov the covenant that the Bible talks about is the new covenant. And Jesus inaugurates the new covenant with his death. That's clearly taught in Scripture, particularly in the book of Hebrews, and I tease that out in my commentary on Hebrews. And so the Mosaic covenant is gone. It is obsolete. It has been essentially superseded or fulfilled by the new covenant. But the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are still in effect. Those covenants have not been abrogated. And therefore, all covenant theologians who want to say, who want to believe in supersessionism, have clearly misunderstood, and in my view, hermeneutically misinterpreted the Old and the New Testament. And in fact, they make God a liar because God says He's going to do certain things for the nation of Israel in the future that relates to land and so forth. And so any, system, any eschatology that does not include a millennium is already suspect, in my view, and that would, of course, include amillennialism and postmillennialism, because I don't see how you can interpret Revelation 20 any other way, nor do I see how you can interpret key passages in the prophets of the Old Testament any other way. Now, that's a short answer. It, it needs to be way more nuanced, uh, and I realize that my all millennial and my reformed friends have steam coming out their ears listening to me. But, you know, somebody That's needs okay. to push back on this. These are the guys who write all the books. Our guys don't write much. And uh, it's time it's time to, to recognize that there's another side to all of this. And not only that, that other side's been around a long time. I will say, while I'm not completely sold on premillennialism, at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, before Dr. David Allen came to work here, there is a class taught by Jim Chatham on eschatology where one of the books is 
a book on premillennialism by Dr. David Allen and his partner in crime. And Chatham's a premillennial. Yeah, Chatham's mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. So everybody's at Trinity's basically premillennial. But uh, Dr. Allen wrote a book uh, alongside uh, Dr. Steve Lemke, his partner in crime. Uh, and what's the title of that book? Uh, it's called, uh, uh, oh my goodness, you would ask me that. I think it's called The Return of Christ, A Premillennial Perspective. That, that that is that that rings a bell that's the, just just google yeah. david allen and and that's um, a multi-author book by the way i have a chapter in there limke has a chapter limke and i are co-editors and there are about 15 uh articles in that book oh by the way you'll find this ironic john MacArthur wrote an endorsement for that book oh wow now, he did he won't write an endorsement of any of my other <laughs> books but when it comes to eschatology john MacArthur and i are like that we are yeah I, I was gonna say I don't know if it's true today, but 10, 10, 20 years ago, if you asked John MacArthur which he cared more about, the issue of Calvinism or the issue of premillennialism, he would have definitely been more uh, on board with, you know, that being more important to him, I think, than Calvinism. But I think that in his later years, that's probably switched. But I, I think John MacArthur probably cared more about that in the 90s, 2000s than than Calvinism. Well, he seemed to be yeah, more, but in their latest Shepherds Conference, his final sermon dealt with premillennialism. He made a case for it out of Zechariah and a pretty good one because I listened to it. And I'm sure there were a lot of young, uh, restless and reformed guys there who uh, kind of had their ears pinned back and their eyes wide open because he was essentially telling them that amillennialism is wrong. <laughs> And of course, I think he's right on that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's that's just a very interesting event that occurred recently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I said that we were done, and that was the last question. But one of our newer folks uh, showed up and asked what I think is going to be pretty simple for well, we Dr. Allen. This, and we but... did address this. That's why I took it out. But then he said, "I see that my question's not going to be answered, and I don't want to leave him like that. So, how do you answer? Give a maybe a quick answer if you want to." People who say this leads to universal yeah. that, that our view of of the atonement leads to universalism. Yeah, that that's that uh, question is answered in detail in both uh, uh, my book on uh, the atonement and the the book on Calvinism, a biblical and theological critique. Uh, and the answer is really very simple. Number one, that argument's never found in Scripture. Uh, number two, it's a logical argument because it's based on the misunderstanding of the mechanism of the atonement. It assumes a commercial, as, a commercial mechanism such that atonement accomplished equals atonement applied. And if atonement accompli is accomplished, how can anybody go to hell? The Bible doesn't teach that's the mechanism. Uh, the atonement doesn't work on the basis of commercial debt. It works on the basis of legal moral debt. Let me illustrate it this way. You and I go to lunch, and I'm planning to buy your lunch, but after lunch, the bill is placed on the table. I reach into my billfold, and I realize I have no money and no credit cards. I'm embarrassed. I tell you I cannot buy your lunch. You say, don't worry about it, David. I've got you covered. You put your credit card down. You pay for our lunch. The restaurant owner doesn't care who pays as long as the bill is paid. That is what is called a pecuniary, or better, another term, let more common, a commercial transaction. Now, the argument that tries to uh, shackle unlimited atonement position with uh, universalism is based on that false commercialism. It's a failure to understand that sin is more than a debt. It is a debt metaphorically, but it is not a debt in terms of mechanism commercially. Sin is a crime, and it's a moral legal issue. So let me illustrate it this way. Suppose, suppose that um, I get so upset that I can't pay the check, so I pull my gun and rob the restaurant and i get five hundred dollars and i abscond into the night and you're left there slack jawed you can't believe what just happened and the restaurant that, owner is a friend of yours and so you say i'm shocked that my friend david allen did that how much did he take he stole five hundred dollars well here i'm gonna i'm gonna write you a check to repay you know what he stole tomorrow when the police find me hiding in the bushes bring me before the judge and the judge says you are condemned for stealing and you are going to be sentenced to five years in prison. I say, well, wait a minute. 
you can't sentence me to five years in prison because Braxton has already paid my debt. Jonathan paid my debt. My debt's been paid. You can't sentence me to prison. Is that going to cut any muster with that judge? No. No. Why? Because sin is a debt, but not a commercial debt. Sin is a moral legal debt. And just because somebody else reimbursed that, that owner, that doesn't get me off the hook. By the way, this is the answer to the double payment argument. This is why the double payment argument is false. Because the double payment argument is based on the same false premise that the universalism argument is based on. And that is that the atonement is some kind of a commercial transaction so that atonement made equals atonement applied. Therefore, God is sending the pe people to hell for whom the atonement has already been applied. It's a failure to understand that there, that God has annexed a condition on the atonement being applied. And that condition is faith in Jesus. The atonement is made for all people. That's atonement accomplished. But it's only applied, it is only applied to those who believe. That's why the universalism uh, argument fails. That's why the double payment argument fails as well. By the way, well, all of this Allen is in my book. The Extent of the Atonement is in the book, The Atonement, the shorter version, and is in the book, Calvinism, a Biblical and Theological Critique. Well, I want to point out to everyone again that in the description, you can find a link to Dr. Allen's ministry, and you can also find a link to Dr. Allen's books on Amazon. And I encourage you, and I'm sure I don't have to encourage you after today's episode to go and check that those things out. And uh, Dr. Allen, this has just been such an honor. We, we, we are very fond of you. We think so highly of you, and you've impacted us and taught us and uh we we are proud to have you on the show and proud to have you at trinity and again if you're someone who would like to learn from dr uh from dr allen or from dr flowers or from us or from tim stratton you can do that by uh going to trinity sem trinity sem.edu and on the right hand side of the page there is a little form it won't take you any time to fill it out and i hope you'll do that if you think at any point in the future you might want to get um theological education from where you are 100% online. You can do this in your pajamas if that's what you choose to do, because you have libertarian freedom and can freely choose to do that if you so wish. <laughs> um, so this has been fantastic. Dr. Allen, any parting words before we go? Well, not really, except to say that, uh, I know that this subject is divisive in the sense of, you know, there, there are two sides of this aisle, but let me just say, that uh, we're all brothers in Christ. This is an, uh, an intra-family debate and discussion. We need to have it with the proper respect. Uh, we need to affirm each other, love each other. We can be firm in uh, our views as I am, and uh, I don't mind expressing my views firmly, but Calvinists express their views firmly as well. So I think we need to respect each other, listen to each other, learn from each other. Iron sharpens iron. But ultimately, the, the bottom line, the measuring stick for all theology is Scripture. It is not my system or your system. It's not Calvin. It's not Wesley. The measuring line is Scripture. Check Amen. all things by Scripture. That's Amen. what I would say. With that, folks, it's been a privilege to be with you. Um, I will be releasing a video in the next few days that I did with Leighton Flowers. And so I hope you'll look for that, uh, responding to Vody Bauckham uh, in a sermon he made. With that, thank you so much, folks. And Dr. Allen, again, thanks to you. And we'll see you all next time on Trinity Radio. <laughs>